Greetings from the Iranian Studies Unit at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. My name is Mehran Khan Rava. One of the areas of tremendous strategic competition in uh, the West Asia region is the South Caucasus. And this region is subject to tremendous geostrategic competition between three of the regional powers, namely Iran, Turkey, and Russia. Of course, there are other countries and they are part of the strategic competition, namely Armenia and Azerbaijan, as well as Georgia. But the main competition is between Iran, Turkey, and Russia. And as we all know, this is an area in which there's been a tremendous conflict violent conflict, in fact, as of uh, as recently as September 2020 with the second uh, war in Nagorno-Karabakh. This competition is largely over natural resources as well as influence and uh, trying to turn the area into regions of influence by the three main powers. Uh, it sometimes goes unnoticed uh, this competition, but it is nonetheless of tremendous importance, particularly when it comes to uh, pipeline politics in relation to the transfer of and the transit of um, uh, uh, LNG as well as oil uh, from Iran and from Azerbaijan and from the Caspian region and from other uh, Central Asian countries uh, over to Europe. Helping us better understand and analyze this competition between Iran, Turkey, and Russia in light of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is perhaps one of the uh, most renowned experts of the topic, Professor Mahmoud Munshipuri, who is Chair and Professor of International Relations at San Francisco State University and also Lecturer in Global Politics and International and Area Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, where he teaches Middle East politics as well as a course entitled Climate Change, Migration, Refugees, and Human Rights. Professor Monchi Puri is the editor most recently of Human Rights Matters in, the Cont in Contemporary Global Affairs, which came out in 2020 by Rutledge. And he's also the author in 2019 of Middle East Politics, Changing Dynamics, again by Rutledge. His recent essays have appeared in Middle East Policy, Seton Hall Journal of Diplomacy and International Affairs, and the Maghreb Review. He's currently working on a project entitled Protest, Pandemic, and Authoritarianism in the Middle East, which will appear in the Georgetown Journal of international affairs. We're tremendously honored, delighted to have you with us, Prefer Professor Monshi Puri, over to you. Thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, um, I'd like to uh, uh, begin by uh, thanking the, uh, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and also Dr. Uh, Kamrabov for the kind uh, words and introduction. It's an honor to be with you today. Um, uh, I would like to uh, start with the definition of a region, but before I do, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Uh, Hamida Dorzadeh uh, uh, and also Ibrahim from the, uh, the Center for, the Arab Center for Research uh, and Policy Studies who have been very helpful uh, in terms of coordinating this meeting. I would also like to express a few words of thanks to uh, my dear and uh, close colleague, uh, wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Javad Heirania, who is uh, based in Tehran. And he has been gracious enough, kind enough to share with me uh, uh, numerous uh, 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 articles published in uh, uh, domestic journals. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, let, me, let me begin with, uh, with uh, define, defining the, the region. Uh, this is a small region, but it is so geographically and also geopolitically important 
because it is located between two seas of uh, Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And just looking at the map, uh, adds a, 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 an extra uh, dimension to our understanding of the significance of the region. Here's another uh, uh, map of the region that shows that the significance of area is that it is next to Russia and, uh, and it's somewhere between North Caucasus and, and Southern part of the Russia. And, and uh, the map uh, speaks volumes in terms of geopolitical significance of the region. Uh, the region consists of three countries of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, population uh, uh, 24 million people. It's a very small area. But it is geographically extremely important because it is a crossing point between the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. The proximity of this region to Caspian Sea and Central Asian republics also adds another dimension of significance. Uh, this is a region uh, of uh, competition and conflict uh, uh, between Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, the uh, European Union in terms of the oil companies, and of course, United States of America. So as you can see, there are so many powers involved, either from region or from outside of the region that have really uh, looking at this region and its importance uh, is attributable to uh, so many factors being interested in that. Uh, almost seven decades of the Soviet legacy has left this area with fragile economies, interminable conflicts, and really lack of uh, democratic legitimacy in the area. Uh, speaking of the history of the region, which is a very rich history, by the way, uh, goes back to the early 19th century when uh, South Caucasus was the sphere of influence and competition between the Ottomans, the Persian empires, and the Russians as well. Subsequently, large parts of this area have been uh, uh, fully absorbed by, into the Russian empire as the Russian empire expanded into the Muslim territory on either side of the Caspian Sea. Uh, the, following the dissolution and collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, these three countries, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, gained their independence. When one look at the geography of the region, uh, one finds out that Armenia is landlocked and is dependent heavily on oil and gas from Russia and Iran. Georgia is very much dependent on oil and gas from Azerbaijan, Russia, and Iran. And the only country in the region that is oil and gas rich in South Caucasus is basically Azerbaijan. And so if you're going to talk about a lot about Azerbaijan, and then of course we're going to shift the theater to Iran and talk about Iran. The region uh, proximity, the region's proximity to Caspian Sea and near, uh, you know, being near uh, the Central Asian republics is another important factor to keep in mind. Uh, let me talk about the significance of Azerbaijan in terms of the oil pipeline. The most important oil pipeline originating from Baku ending in Jayan, uh, 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 Turkey is known as Baku Tbilisi Jayan Oil Pipeline, BTC that is uh, probably one of the major oil pipelines uh, that is going from Baku to Turkey. And Western companies, oil companies, they're very keen in supporting the creation of this uh, pipeline back in 2005. Uh, another uh, gas pipeline that again connects uh, Baku to uh, central part of Turkey is known as Baku Tbilisi Erzurum which is uh, also known as South Caucasus Pipeline, otherwise uh, is known as the Shah Deniz Pipeline, and Shah Deniz Pipeline being uh, uh, the, the pipeline that originates in, in Caspian Sea. Again, you can see that the significance of this pipeline have largely to do with the, has largely to do with the fact that the Western companies wanted to make sure that they will find a way to uh, circumvent Russia and, 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 and uh, reduce their dependency on the Russian oil and gas. Uh, two more uh, pipelines of significance are again originating from Baku 
Uh, one is Baku Supsa uh, that goes from Baku into the Georgia and onto the uh, Black Sea. And the other one is called the uh, Novorossiysk oil pipeline that again originates from Baku, but it goes not through Georgia, but rather through Russia and uh, ends up in the north part of the uh, Black Sea. These are also two important pipelines. The significance of these two pipelines are that they will be connected to other pipelines to Europe. And all of this competition in the region among these pipelines uh, trying to circumvent, trying to bypass Russia shows that there is so much competition as Professor Kamrava mentioned uh, at, uh, in his opening remarks, this competition has really limited cooperation between the countries. And that's basically the, the, uh, the gist of this, this uh, presentation. Uh, there is a, there's a gas pipeline known as Trans-Anatolia gas pipeline, uh, which is known as TANAP. TANAP connects Turkey to the European countries. And then there is another line known as uh, Trans-Adriatic pipeline project that connects TANAP to uh, all the way to the Eastern European countries, Albania and some other countries. So you see that these are the connections that they start from Baku, but they end up uh, in uh, you know, Greece and Albania and other, uh, East, some of the Eastern European countries on the other end. So the reason that I started this maps because I wanted to talk about the significance of this map. When you look at this maps, number one issue that stands out to us is that Azerbaijan has become a very important player on the scene. The second point is that uh, Russia is not happy with the type of competition that Azerbaijan presents to it. The competition with Russian oil and gas industry uh, has always been a major concern of Russia. The third point that needs to be underscored here is that the role of Turkey and the significance of Turkey and also uh, the fact that why Turkey has entered into these South Caucasus power and geopolitical equations. Turkey has basically become the land connector for the transfer of oil and gas to Europe. Almost 72% of oil and approximately 73% of the gas that goes from the region to Europe ends up going through, uh, through Turkey. So Turkey uh, has become the overland connection between Baku and the oil and gas that ends up going to Europe. As an energy hub, Turkey has become a very important EU energy supply line. It actually possesses one of the largest energy markets in Europe. Uh, let me talk about Iran uh, and its strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, South Caucasus. Iranian strategy in South Caucasus has almost always been driven by geopolitical considerations and not really uh, ideological concerns. Iran has always uh, declared its policy towards uh, the tensions in uh, uh, South Caucasus uh, to be a position of neutrality. And sometimes people like uh, 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 Kehana Barzagar, one of our good and uh, expert uh, uh, colleagues in, in, in the region, calls that positive neutrality. That Iranians are not going to just be neutral, but they wanna be positive in terms of trying to mediate as much as possible uh, the tensions in the region, especially the ones that are ongoing between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And, and Iranians have uh, uh, a lot of uh, interest in maintaining regional stability. And, and, the, and, and it is in this context that they have actually played a role with, which is uh, defined as positive neutrality. And we talk about this neutrality when it comes to the second uh, Nagorno-Karabakh which absolutely Iranians had a change of position because of the developments on the ground. Iranians at the same time of, uh, you know, uh, they are kind of playing two level games. They have an outside game, which they show that they are supporting Azerbaijan because Azerbaijan is a Muslim country and a Shiite Muslim and a country and Iranians try to actually play this outside game. 
But at the same time, Iranians play what is called inside game. That is, that is the decision within the political elites, ruling elites, and the government, which they show that they are sympathetic to Armenia. And they have historically played this two game level outside, inside. If, if you're not comfortable with these concepts, one can use the concepts of public and private diplomacy. Public diplomacy shows that Iranians are supporting Azerbaijan and the private diplomacy, they are signaling to Armenia that they are favoring uh, their positions and they're on their side. Uh, regardless, two major factors have uh, uh, enormously uh, shaped the Iranian uh, foreign policy. One clearly is the US isolation of Iran via sanctions. That every move that Iranians make in the region, the South Caucasus region, is somehow or other influenced by the sanction by the US isolation of Iran. But the, the second factor is closely related to the first one, is that, that Iranians have adopted kind of a Russian-centric perspective in large part because of the uh, isolation that, that, that are subject and exposed to the American influence. The result has been, when I look at the Iranian foreign policy conduct in the region, my conclusion is that Iranians have not been really proactive. They have always been kind of uh, like a dexical, uh, reacting slowly to the developments. They haven't really taken that initiative unless they have reached a point where their national security interests have been uh, at risk. So uh, that's the way the Iranians, I'm going to come back to this issue later on. That's the way that Iranians have dealt with that. Let me briefly just. Uh, uh, talk about uh, Iran's oil pipeline. Uh, th there are several active oil pipelines and gas pipelines in the region. Uh, the Iranian, uh, Armenian gas pipeline, uh, Tabriz Ankara gas pipelines, and recently Iranians have uh, the, are in, in, the, in the process of uh, uh, creating the Gora gas crude uh, Oil pipeline. I'll talk that in the in the the, the segue slides that I have to to share with you. And there are a lot of oil pipelines or gas pipelines that have been proposed, but they have never uh, come to fruition. A case in point: uh, Naboko uh, gas pipeline, which is supposed to uh, be connected from the pipeline that comes from Baku, and and then the second leg of that would be Iran, and they both actually become one pipeline, ending up going to Turkey. Iran, Armenia, Georgia gas pipeline, this idea was proposed, but it failed and never came to fruition. Iran, Iraq, Syria, friendship pipeline, again, it was proposed on paper. It was a good idea, but actually it uh, never materialized. Iran, Pakistan pipeline, peace pipeline, it has been proposed, but seems to be inactive because no uh, action has been taken. When, when one looks at all these failed proposal, uh, uh, it is largely uh, related to the fact that they are subject to uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions. But, but let me just briefly talk about the Gora Jask pipeline. This is a pipeline that would be within the southern part of Iran, connecting Boucher to Jask, and will have the capacity to transfer up to 1 million barrels of crude oil a day from Gora in the, uh, near the uh, uh, Boucher uh, uh, port uh, uh, to uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, you know, trying to get around the Strait of Hormuz onto the oil terminal at Jask, which is in the Sea of Oman. Uh, this pipeline is uh, designed to bypass the Strait of Hormuz for uh, its oil exports. The irony in this uh, proposal is that Iranians have always said that they are going to block the Strait of Hormuz if uh, they are going to be uh, attacked by USA or uh, something happens that would run counter to their interests. But after a while, you know, Iranians realized that this rhetoric is not also serving their interests because a lot of oil companies are not eager to uh, invest in this project, uh, uh, you know, in the fear of the, you know, political turmoil uh, in the vicinity of the uh, Strait of Hormuz. So the irony is that Iranians themselves have designed a pipeline uh, in intent on bypassing the Strait of 
Hormoz. That is, I, I felt like there's a little bit of irony in that. And the possibility of exporting gas from South uh, uh, Pars gas field uh, is also uh, linked to this uh, Agora JASC uh, uh, pipeline. This terminal provides a shorter uh, route for uh, liquefied natural gas carriers, and it could be a possibility or opportunity to compete with Qatar. It seems to me that Qatar has gone uh, forward with uh, connecting uh, its lines uh, under the sea with Pakistan and, and uh, basically replacing some of these proposals that Iranians have. This is a map that shows that, as you can see, the Gora port here next to uh, uh, Band to the north of uh, uh, Bandar Boucher. This, uh, this is a pipeline that will come all the way and you know, uh, uh, gets around uh, Strait of Hormoz onto uh, 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 just uh, uh, port in the Gulf of Oman. Let me shift the theater to Russia and talk about Russia. Some would argue that Russia uh, is a dominant player in the region. I put a question mark in front of that because I'm not sure that Russia is a dominant player. Now that I see Turkey actually coming into the equation. I would argue, however, that uh, uh, Russia is a very important player. I don't know whether it's a dominant player. It is a very important player in the region. And it is the main uh, supplier of energy to Georgia and Armenia. Uh, it's not happy with the way that Iranian uh, at times attempt to participate in energy sectors of Armenia, especially Georgia. Um, the Russians have expressed their interest in the creation of a north-south corridor that would connect Russia uh, to Persian Gulf region through Iran and onto India. That is a project that uh, uh, it's on the paper, but uh, when it comes to India, India uh, would like to avoid uh, sanctions uh, imposed uh, on projects like this uh, by USA. So India, it kind of is, it seems to be reluctant to, to get involved in projects like this. Um, but uh, Russia uh, is interested in balancing uh, the growing Turkish influence. Um, uh, in large part, uh, it seems to me that Russia is interested in drawing a wedge in sometimes the contentious relationship between Turkey and the West. And, and they try to exploit that. And they know that uh, Turkey is a member of NATO and if they can uh, create a situation where they can cooperate with Turkey, that could uh, create a wedge in the Western uh, world camps with regard to Turkey. Uh, they would like to end the US intervention in the Caucasus region uh, uh, as much as they can. Uh, the recent uh, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh war actually contributed to that because we saw that the Western world, and you know, typically the Minsk group consisting of uh, 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 France and United States and, and Russia, the Minsk group, which represents the Organization for the Security and Cooperation of Europe, actually stayed on the sideline when the war in Nagorno-Karabakh erupted. And the only question mark that I have, and it's a very important point, is that I don't know, I haven't really seen any data that shows that whether or not there are domestic support for Russia to get involved in the dispute between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. My hunch is that I have a sneaking suspicion that there is not much domestic support for the role that Russians would like to play to get in the middle of this conflict by peacekeeping, you know, uh, uh, putting peace, peacekeeping troops on the ground or getting involved Russia, as it currently stands, as it stands now, uh, uh, encounters and faces uh, tremendous domestic problems, uh, the, uh, the, the, the decline of the oil, the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and a number of economic issues, problems. And I really, frankly, don't see that much domestic support for the Russian involvement uh, in the Karabakh war. Let me turn to Armenia. Armenia is a landlocked country with really few options. They have always relied on Russia for the gas and oil consumptions. 
uh, and they suffered tremendous defeat in the uh, recent Nagorno-Karabakh war. Uh, they seem to be uh, heavily dependent on oil from Russia and to lesser extent uh, on gas from Iran. But Armenia is the only country in the South Caucasus that is home to a Russian military base in uh, a Gomri uh, area. Uh, that has one advantage and another disadvantage. The advantage is that they can rely on uh, Russians uh, if there is a war, if they're involved in war, they can rely on the support from Russia. The other problem is that when it comes to Nagorno-Karabakh, which is outside of the uh, Rome, uh, Armenia or Nakhjavan, which is outside of uh, Armenia, they seem to be at a little bit of disadvantage because it's not clear based on the, the security treaty that, that they have with Russia, it's not clear the Russian will come to the rescue uh, because the way that that security pact has been actually designed. Uh, uh, Armenians uh, would like very much to diversify their energy supplies by relying on Iran, but when I look at Armenia, it's a country with very few options and very few allies in the region. In fact, the second Nagorno-Karabakh, which led to uh, Ar Armenia losing about seven districts and uh, 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 Shusha and other places to uh, uh, Azerbaijan, there was a tremendous and profound sense of betrayal Betrayal by Russia. Russia didn't come to the rescue because Russia said, look, uh, this is a war that is happening outside of Armenia proper. If it was inside, then we had a, a, a commitment to come to your rescue. But this was happening outside. And Iranians also changed profoundly their positions because the developments on the ground radically and drastically changed. Of course, Russians have a problem with the uh, 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 the current uh, Armenian uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Nikol uh, Pashinyan, uh, Pashinyan, who in the past have shown some, uh, you know, uh, 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 tendency to move toward the West. Uh, in the past, Armenians have always avoided talking about NATO, but Pashinyans and others have started kind of talking about, you know, alliance with the West and all these things. And that actually caused tremendous resentment by Russians. And I think Putin decided to uh, let this war go on and not protect uh, Nagorno-Karabakh to, in a sense, punish uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Nikol uh, uh, Pashinyan's. And that was, of course, the, 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 the sense that uh, uh, Washingtonians actually called Putin and said, "We really need your help in the Nagorno-Karabakh." And it, it just happened that that Putin uh, was reluctant to help because it has its own ideas of punishing uh, um, Armenia. Let me let me talk uh, uh, about Turkey because I think Turkey is a very important player and is becoming increasingly uh, involved in the in the South Caucasus power equation, geopolitical equation. Um, Turkey has always had this ambition of a over, you know, land connection directly with Azerbaijan. What has stood between Azerbaijan and Turkey has always been Iranian territory through Armenia. Now, with the defeat of uh, Armenia and regaining control of Nagorno-Karabakh by Azerbaijan, there is a possibility, and I underline the term possibility. There is a project, there is a possibility that there would be a direct corridor of connection between Azerbaijan and Nakhjavan and, and Turkey, and that would be a place, uh, a corridor called the uh, Zangazur Corridor. In the recent meeting between Erdogan and Ilham Aliyev, uh, uh, president of Azerbaijan, uh, there was a declaration known as uh, Shusha, which is a very historical place. By the way, it was regained. The control of that was regained by Azerbaijan in the recent Nagorno 
Karabakh War. In the uh, Ishusha Declaration, which was uh, announced on five days ago, June 15, uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey have started talking about a corridor that connects directly Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan and to Turkey. Uh, this is a direct a new land connection uh, with Azerbaijan. And if that project goes through, then Turkey not only will have access to South Caucasus, but it will have direct access to Caspian Sea and Central Asian republics. That has been a long standing aspiration of Turkey. And I think that Turkey feels like they are one step closer to that, fulfilling that aspiration. If that happens, if that becomes a possibility, if it comes to pass, then this could very well cut off uh, Turkey's dependency on gas and oil from Iran. And Turkey and Iran have a gas uh, oil uh, deal that will expire in 2026, uh, five years from now. And it seems to me that if this corridor comes to actually pass, uh, it will cut off Turkey's dependency on oil and gas from Iran, and Turkey will be highly unlikely to resign a new oil and, and gas contract uh, with Iran and will get one step closer to its dream of becoming a, a very authentic uh, regional energy hub. Now that we have talked about Nagorno-Karabakh, let me just uh, touch base with you on a little bit about what happened due to the time constraints. I cannot have enough time to, exp to explain that, but maybe during uh, uh, the, the Q&A question and answers, I'll be happy to uh, answer any question that, uh, that is raised uh, in this connection. The first Nagorno-Karabakh was a very lengthy war. It happened from 1988 and it ended around 1994. It coincided with the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. And, and in this war, Armenia was able to uh, 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 control Nagorno-Karabakh, to regain control of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which was very important for them. And Nagorno-Karabakh is a place where the majority of the people, it's an enclave, majority of people are Armenians, only 20 to 23% of the population are of Azeri. Uh, in the second Nagorno-Karabakh, that happened from somewhere in, you know, sometimes in September uh, and end up around November 10th, a war that lasted for only 44 days. Uh, Azerbaijan was able to regain, not entire Nagorno-Karabakh. I'm not quite sure that Azerbaijan really wants to gain the control of entire Nagorno-Karabakh, given uh, that the large population of Christians living there. It just wants, I don't know, maybe seven to, you know, six to seven districts, and especially uh, the, uh, uh, the city of uh, uh, Shusha, uh, uh, and was able to uh, regain that. Uh, and because of this uh, development, Iran faced uh, tremendous challenges having to do with the shifting balance of power in the region. Uh, up until then, Iranian position, the inside game and outside game was kind of, you know, we, you know our position is neutral. We would like to see the uh, peaceful resolution of the conflict. But because of the fact that Azerbaijan was able to defeat Armenia, and because of the fact that we have an ethnic Azeri population in the uh, uh, north, uh, in, in, in the western part of the country, northwestern part of the country. Iran has a Azeri population of uh, making up approximately 60 to 20% of the population. It's a huge, it's a massive population of, uh, of, of the Azeri, which is close to a quarter uh, you know, percent of, of the population of Iran. Iranians changed their position. Uh, as it happens, uh, it's it just that, uh, that uh, a number of the representative of uh, supreme leader, the so-called imams, four imams in the, uh, in the Azerbaijan area uh, approached the supreme leader and said like, we have to take a position in favor of, uh, 
uh, uh, Azerbaijan because uh, Nagorno-Karabakh has been uh, now uh, has fallen into the control uh, of uh, Azerbaijan. And because of this reality on the ground, Ayatollah Khamenei, Iranian supreme leader, came out and said uh, very clearly for the first time that uh, Karabakh is the land of Islam. This is the so-called outside game that Iranians are playing directly, sending the message that because of the fate accompli, they decided to change their position. Some would say, well, this was not a very important development for Iranian to changing their position in favor of Azerbaijan against Armenia. But I would consider that to be a tectonic shift. This is to me a seismic, a seismic shift in the region because it speaks volumes about the, the shifting political landscape in the region. Let me stay on with the narrative of the second Nagorno-Karabakh because I want to talk about the implication and the new realities uh, caused as a result of that. This was a major victory for the Republic of Azerbaijan because it will create direct connection between Azerbaijan and Turkey. And Turkey will be the chief beneficiaries of gaining access to uh, the exclave of Nahjavan, which is the part, I'm gonna show you through the maps, following the maps that Nahjavan was an exclave that was separating, uh, uh, being separated by Armenia from Azerbaijan, albeit that it is part of Azerbaijan. Uh, for Iran, uh, the fact that uh, now there is a direct access by Azerbaijan in uh, Nahjavan, I think it's a great loss. It's a great loss in terms of the transit income, because in the past, if you were in Azerbaijan and you wanted to go to Nahjavan, you have to go through Iran, because between Azerbaijan and Nahjavan, was Armenia. Now, uh, that connection seems to be a direct connection and Azeris, Azerbaijanis, they don't need to go through Iran in order to get to Nahjavan. And so if Turkey wanted to uh, uh, have trade ties to Azerbaijan, they have no other choice but to go through Nahjavan. And Iran was controlling Nahjavan and Turkey had to pay enormous transit income, you know, transit revenue to Iran to get uh, to Azerbaijan. So by losing control of Nahjavan, Turkey now bypasses Iran and actually goes through Nahjavan and then through uh, courier uh, Sangazur, they will have direct access to Azerbaijan. This direct connection between Turkey and Azerbaijan shows that Iranian direct control to Armenia fall in jeopardy. And because of that, Iranian have made several trips, not only to uh, uh, Azerbaijan, but also to Russia and, all, and even to Georgia, trying to uh, alert the region, the regional uh, uh, states to the red lines, that is to say that uh, Zarif uh, in late May made a travel to Azerbaijan and sat with uh, his counterpart and also uh, with uh, uh, President uh, Elham Ali, uh, Aliyev and said, look, you cannot disconnect our land with uh, Armenia. If you cut off that land, this is a red line and we are not gonna tolerate that. And uh, they also convey the same message to Russia they also convey the same message to Georgia so that everybody know exactly, everybody knows exactly where are the red lines. Look at the map. Uh, uh, do you see this is uh, Azerbaijan? And this is uh, again Azerbaijan, but this is a part of Azerbaijan, which is known as the Republic of, you know, Nahjavan. Between Nahjavan here and Azerbaijan lies Armenia. So when we talk about uh, uh, Zangazur Corridor, before the ceasefire that was imposed on the countries involved by Russia, Iran provided the only overland connection between Azerbaijan and Nahjavan exclave. But now the situation 
has changed because the the, uh, the transport courier which will connect the main part of Azerbaijan with the exclave uh, Nakhchivan now can actually pass through Zangazur. And if that becomes a possibility, it will create a direct connection between Azerbaijan and Nakhchivan, and Azerbaijan doesn't need Iran anymore to get into Nakhchivan. In the uh, Shusha Declaration, which was signed five days ago, as I mentioned that earlier, uh, that uh, uh, Zangazur corridor provides direct link between Nakhchivan and Turkey, connecting uh, with Turkey with Azerbaijan without having to go through Iran. This is a very important development. Look at uh, Zangazur on the map. You have Azerbaijan, you have Nakhchivan here. Uh, Zangazur is the region that is going to be uh, the direct uh, uh, connector between Azerbaijan and uh, and uh, uh, Nakhchivan, and the 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 same place that the Azeris will call uh, Zangazur, uh, the Armenians will call Sinik Province. If you look at the Sinik Province here, this is uh, uh, the the uh, the Armenian name for this area that connects Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan. So that's the significance of this. Uh, uh, let me just come to the a little bit closer to the conclusion of this, this discussion. Uh, is the great game over? This is basically the debate. Professor Kamraba, uh, approximately uh, four years ago, edited a wonderful, wonderful volume entitled The Great uh, Game in uh, West Asia that I had the good fortune and pleasure of contributing a chapter to that. And uh, there are two perspectives on what is going on with the Great King. The first view is that uh, I spoke with uh, an Iranian expert who is a, a professor at Sharif University, uh, Dr. Uh, Abbas Maliki, who made the argument that for all uh, practical purposes and intents, uh, uh, the, the Great Game is over. It's over in the sense that Iran is entertaining the possibility of uh, entering into the Euro-Asia Economic Union, uh, along with Armenia, Belarus, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia. And, and that makes the uh, significance of what's happening in South Caucasus, you know, it will actually, uh, not, not that it makes the, the politics, the geopolitics of South Caucasus irrelevant, but it just doesn't uh, uh, doesn't give that much uh, credence and 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 support to the idea that 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 uh, the South Caucasus is as significant as it used to be. But the problem with Euro Asia Economic Union and Iran's bid to enter into that is nicely debated by uh, Shirin Hunter, who argues that. Uh, look, if Iran accepts the bid to enter into EAEU, uh, the so-called Eurasia Economic Union, Russians will have easy access to Iranian markets. Russians will have tremendous control of Iranian foreign policy. This would be another way to make Iran subservient to the uh, Russian uh, regional policy. So she warns against Iranians accepting uh, this be to join the Euro-Asian Economic Union. But there are some uh, people, some experts uh, in Iran who argue otherwise. Uh, Professor Maliki and, and Maliki and others, uh, they argue that, look, uh, the South Caucasus game is an old game. The new game is a so-called One Belt, One Road initiative by China. And uh, he argues that we need to connect with uh, uh, we need to turn to Asia, we need to connect with Asia. Uh, if we can sell our gas and oil to Asia, they will pay much higher than what the Europeans do. And we can uh, benefit from that relationship. And the big game is one build one road. And that's where the new game is going to be played. Um, and um, there are other uh, experts who support the fact that the, the South Caucasus game is over with. They argue that Iran and Russia are likely to work together on alternative transportation routes, such as the uh, north-south 
corridor. It's a railway that will connect Russia uh, to Persian Gulf and from Persian Gulf to India. The only problem with this perspective, which happens to be, by the way, a very important problem, is that a lot of countries in East Asia and in West Asia, including India, Pakistan, and in, in Southeast Asia, Japan, South Korea, and we can add Australia to that, they are reluctant to work with Iran because of the sanctions. You know, the talk of creating a north-south corridor that connects Russia to Persian Gulf, and Russia can then sell and have trade ties with India, Pakistan, and all these things, at some point, these countries are reluctant. They have shown historically they are reluctant to work with Iran. We have seen that in Chabahar project. We have seen that in you know Iranian, you know Pakistani, you know uh, peace pipelines. They the things don't work. Why? Because these countries are reluctant to engage Iran because of the Tehran. Let me let me shift to the second uh, view, which is consistent with what uh, uh, Professor Kamrabo has written and uh, what I think is is going to be the case. The second uh, perspective says the great game is not dead. Uh, but, but more than that, what is more important than that is that the great game has intensified more than the past. Turkey is playing with conviction, with purpose, with a strategic patience in the, in the South Caucasus. Russia is exploiting this great game by remaining relevant, if not the most dominant player, but it's this very important player. Iran. On the other hand, by contrast, seems to me is inconsistent, erratic, like a dexical, and is reacting. By the time that Iranians started to talk about positive neutrality and reaction to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, for all practical purposes and intents, Nagorno-Karabakh was over with. Yes. There is an argument that in 20 to 30 years, oil industry is going to be out. I agree with that. But until then, at least for the next 25 years, oil factor and gas factors still, I think, is very important. Uh, let me conclude by uh, several uh, takeaways. When I look at the situation of Iran, Iranian uh, security interests and policies in the South Caucasus, um, I come away with the notion that Iran's hand contained very few winning cards. Uh, Russia and Iranian interests, conflict more than overlap in South Caucasus. Clearly conflict more than overlap. The Zangazur corridor project, if it comes to pass, it will undermine Iranian transit uh, or transportation routes. And Russia, it seems to me, that has increasingly defined its economic and trade interests more in sync and in line with those of Turkey than Iran. And finally, and that is a very important uh, conclusion to my paper and to uh, the paper that I am doing uh, with uh, uh, Professor Javad Heyraniya, uh, the colleague of mine in Tehran, we're working uh, on a project on that. Our conclusion is that, you know, at the end of the day, resolution of the problems with the West more generally, and with the United States in particular, will unlock Iranian maximum economic potential and political opportunities in the region. Hence the significance and importance of the uh, nuclear talks in Vienna right now. I see no way getting around that, that until Iranians resolve their problems with the West, they will not benefit from the pipeline politics and the new game, which is ongoing game in South Caucasus. And, and, and at the end of the day, that conflict has to be resolved if Iranians are going to be uh, playing a very sound and very uh, helpful geopolitics in the region. Professor Kamrava, let me stop at this point. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Mahmoud. I really appreciate it. This was a terrific and concise and in-depth discussion of a very complex uh, set of uh, games, as you mentioned, that is continuing. Uh, uh, thank you very much. We have a lot of questions. 
Uh, let me ask our audience if they have questions, they can either raise their hand or submit questions online through our social media channels. And these questions come to me and I'll do my best uh, to get to all of them. Although, uh, Mahmoud, we already have a, a lot of questions, more than 10 questions. And uh, because uh, we ran a little over during the presentation, I ask that you, uh, as much as possible, please keep the uh, responses very brief and concise so that we can get to as many of them as possible. And uh, I, I have a number of questions myself, but in the interest of time and uh, uh, in order to get to our audience's questions, I'll, I'll skip mine. So can you please elaborate a little on the precise role that Iran played in the latest conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia? You mentioned uh, that Iran uh, played this two-level game, but uh, can you be a little more in depth and uh, a little more detailed, uh, but very quick if possible? Sure, uh, thank you. This is a very critical question. Uh, um, Iran was in a way uh, taken aback by the, by the war. And it seems to me that Iran was so engaged uh, with the issues of Syria, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, and uh, uh, Palestine that it, it kind of lost its sight on, uh, on, uh, on the North Caucasus. And by the time the Iranians uh, uh, came to, our, uh, to their senses and they tried to kind of formulate a policy of neutrality, uh, the, the Nagorno Karabakh was, uh, was in the middle of the, uh, the conflict, and Azeris have taken the initiative. And despite the fact that Turkey did not actually uh, use its troops, uh, but there, there's a story that Turkey used some of the uh, radical Sunni groups uh, that they used in uh, uh, Syria. They used the same forces uh, on, uh, on the Nagorno Karabakh war. Iranians were caught kind of by surprise. And Iranians also put some troops uh, on their borders with Armenia, but it was too late and the momentum was on the side of uh, Azerbaijan. And Turkey uh, did not send any uh, you know, troops to go to be involved in the war, but rather help militarily uh, Azerbaijan enormously to help Azerbaijan to win this war. Iranian then, saw that they are faced with the fate of company, that, that Nagorno-Karabakh is being regained by Azerbaijan. And in order to kind of catch up with the game, they started by changing their position on the ground and saying that Karabakh is the land of Islam. And by the time that Iranians decided to take a political position and get them and get themselves involved in the war, it was almost a done deal that the Azer, Azer, Azerbaijan has actually taken and regained the control of Nagorno-Karabakh. So Iranians kind of okay. acted. They were, I don't want to say the Iranian policy toward Nagorno-Karabakh was confused, but I can surely say it was inconsistent. It was reactive. Perfect. Thank you so much. You mentioned uh, that Iran has a large Azer population. Um, to what extent uh, or does uh, this ethnic element play a role in Iran's relations with the South Caucasus? Oh, it plays a very important role. It play, plays a very important role. You know, uh, before the war of uh, uh, Nagorno, the recent Nagorno-Karabakh, the, the politics, the geopolitics of the region was heavily influenced by elites. But now what we are seeing is that the, the expectations of the populations of these countries have also come into play. The, the expectation is that that you know uh, uh, that the Azeris now have tremendous sympathy uh, on the other side. And in one of the, uh, the presentations or one of the visits that Erdogan paid to Azerbaijan, he clearly spoke and recited a poem about the two sides of the Aras River becoming one that created a great deal of resentment in Iran. And, and Zarif and Rouhani 
uh, uh, both expressed their disagreement and they raised their voice and called their ambassadors and said, sent a message to Erdogan, you cannot play that kind of language that, that means the, the, the reunification of Azari from both sides. Iranians are extremely sensitive. There are within that Azari, Azerbaijan populations inside Iran, there are movements of awakening, there are movements that there is like a Congress is known as WAX, W-A-C, that there are meetings of uh, irredentist sentiment, uh, the cessationist sentiments that are brewing, you know, under the surface, they are growing. And Iranians are super sensitive to the fact that if they do not take a position in favor of Azerbaijan, this is going to create turmoil within the Azeri population. I think it's a very important and delicate part that Iranians are very sensitive and they are very, very uh, keen not to uh, uh, allow that sentiments from both sides of Azerbaijan and Azeri Iranians, those sentiments come together because it could be very explosive. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a question. Uh, there's a couple of questions you uh, about the role of uh, religion um, in uh, in Iran. Uh, uh, what 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 significance does religion have in Iran's relations with the South Caucasus? Is it used as a sort of soft power? Does religion make Iran's role in the South Caucasus attractive to the population? I don't think so. I think I think the the Iranian involvement in South Caucasus has always been based on uh, geopolitics. Has been based on how do they can uh, balance the relationship with the uh, Moscow. How they can uh, maintain you know uh, the pipelines going to uh, the Azerbaijan, Georgia, and other places. Uh, it has less to do with ideology. Iranians have, uh, historically since 1994 they have a position in favor of. Uh, uh, Armenia, in large part because Iranians did not want to face the uh, the wrath and the anger of Moscow, and they wanted to line up with Moscow. And it was the game that Iranians have played in South Caucasus has always been based on geopolitics, you know, on, on the geo realities on the ground, and has been less, as a Shiite country, they never supported Azerbaijan, which is another Shiite country in the region. And they, they, they throw their support behind Armenia, in large part because of the geopolitics. I don't think they really have that much soft power. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, as, as we all know, Iranians went to the poll on Friday and elected a new president. How do you um, uh, anticipate the new presidency of Raisi uh, will impact Iran's relations with the countries of the South Caucasus? I do not frankly see that much change. I, I, I think that, uh, uh, this election shows that that uh, the uh, the reformists have been discredited. The reformists have not done much to help the economy, and uh, plus the sanctions, the the harsh and draconian sanctions that were imposed on Iran really uh, undermine the influence of reformists. Uh, Professor uh, Doraj and myself have the good fortune of uh, 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 publishing an article in the summer issue of. Uh, uh, the Middle East Journal, in which we argue that that uh, that uh, the the American sanctions have always undermined reformists, have always helped and precipitate uh, the uh, the coming to uh, power of the uh, conservatives. I I don't think it, regardless of who is in Iran, reformist uh, or or conservative or or uh, moderates. It doesn't really have that much uh, leverage and control over the South uh, Caucasus politics. The Iranian position continues to be neutrality, and uh, regardless of who is in power in Tehran, that policy will continue. Uh, thank you, Mahmoud. Quickly, uh, as we know, there are, uh, and as you mentioned, there are uh, two actors, uh, outside actors, that are present uh, in uh, the South Caucasus. One is the United States that has bases in Georgia and in uh, Azerbaijan. And the other is Israel, which uh, is quite active and quite present in, um, in Azerbaijan. 
in what ways does that impact Iran's position uh, and its relations with uh, the countries of the region? Well, I think uh, in the Second Karabakh War, the so-called Minsk group, uh, this is a group that is part of the uh, organization of the security and cooperation in Europe, which consists of the United States, France, and, and, uh, and Russia. They are the kind of co-chairs of this uh, Minsk group. The Minsk group actually stayed on the sideline and, and, uh, and did not play a very significant role in the Second Nagorno-Karabakh which uh, allow Russia to play a very significant role and say, look, I am the key player here. And, and in, at one point, uh, 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 we saw France taking a position in favor of Armenia, but that kind of, kind of faded away uh, very soon and it did not really add up to anything. Israeli's connection with Azer, uh, Azerbaijan, especially the mountainous area of Azerbaijan where the Israelis can set up their security uh, 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 devices there to spy on Iran, other things, and also having a, a kind of a, a, a military deals with Azerbaijan has always made Iran nervous and always actually raised red, red flags on the part of Iran. Uh, and, and one of the things that I read, which was a complete shock and surprise to me, is that, that, that uh, uh, Israelis helped Azerbaijan with drones in the Nagorno-Karabakh to defeat Armenia, which again shows that Israelis helped a predominantly Shia and Muslim country to defeat an Armenian Christian country simply because Israeli is actually a very tough geo-strategic and realist players on the scene. They really do not care about you know, are they helping a Muslim country fighting against a Christian country? They are thinking that their arch enemy is Iran. If somehow they can create a situation that the balance of power favors Azerbaijan, that would be something that they're actually pursuing. And that was to me an utter shock that Israelis provided drones to our Azeris to, to defeat the uh, uh, Armenians. Thank you. One last question. Uh, and this has to do with uh, the nature of Iran's policy in relation to the South Caucasus, which you correctly observe is reactive rather than active. Uh, in addition to the factors you outlined, the sanctions and the role of Russia, are there domestic factors inside Iran that make its foreign policy in relation to the South Caucasus and one can say in relation to other parts of the world, reactive rather than proactive. Well, I think uh, the Iranian uh, population, like uh, uh, most populations of other nation states, look at the United States, the American public in the, in, uh, you know, when they go to cast their votes in elections, it's all about economy. It's all about domestic economic situation. They really care less about foreign policy. Foreign policy doesn't figure prominently in their voting patterns, in their voting decisions. And, and the same with Iran. Iranian uh, people, because of this very difficult sanctions and difficult economic conditions, not to mention the COVID-19 pandemic and other problems that have been really added problems, they are so economically troubled and in desperate times that I am not sure the domestic Iranian foreign policy, the domestic Iranians are really having a factor uh, on, on Iranian foreign policy. Professor, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Heyranian uh, uh, argues that what this recent election in Iran clearly demonstrated was that the Iranian middle class has actually sat home and they did not participate. And Iranian middle class have always been the bulwark of support for democratic transition, democratic ideas, civil society, human rights. And then because of economic insecurity that they have endured in the last three, four years, they have decided not to participate in elections and they have become numb to uh, issues of foreign policy and domestic policy, and they have shown their resistance uh, this way. 
I think the domestic factors in it, it do not really actually affect Iranian foreign policy enormously. Okay. In green movement, if I might add, uh, in the green movement, uh, there were some uh, uh, you know people who chanted uh, "No to Gaza, No to Lebanon," and you know my soul uh, will be uh, for Iran. And this was the only time that we saw kind of reactions to the public opinion to the foreign policy issues. But ever since 2009 and the, uh, the, the collapse of the Green Movement or the defeat of the Green Movement, uh, the, the, the Iranian domestic factors have really actually been um, uh, um, sidelined by the major domestic economic problems. Perfect. Thank you so very much, Professor Mahmoud Monshipuri uh, from San Francisco State University. This was an excellent presentation and you helped us better understand the very complicated and complex set of competitions between Iran, Turkey, Russia, Armenia, and uh, Georgia. Thank you so very much. Let me also take this opportunity to thank our audiences around the world and also my colleagues behind the scenes uh, who've made this uh, possible. Uh, my sincere thanks to everyone, particularly to Professor Mahmoud Konshipuri. Have a good day. A pleasure as always. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.